Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 104, that passage there. I gain understanding from your precepts. Precepts is another word for the Word of God. I get understanding when I'm reading the Bible. Though it cost all you have, get understanding. It's worth all the gold and silver you've got. Get understanding. The next scripture, amen, in Psalm 111 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts, the word, have good understanding. Adam didn't know that he had an Eve in him until God put him to sleep. It was in the darkness that Eve came forth from Adam. Abraham didn't know that he had a nation in him, but God brought forth a nation. What it, what it is is you don't understand your value. You don't have an understanding until you get in the word of what God has planted in you. Jesus was put into a tomb, and the Scripture says three days later he resurrected. I've often said he wasn't buried, he was planted. And the Scripture says on the third day God did seed time and harvest. So it took three days for seed, little time, and harvest. And then Jesus came forth and brought many sons and daughters into the kingdom. The understanding is, is we don't recognize what's inside of us because uh, perhaps we've not given in or given up or allowed Jesus uh, to rule in our lives. We don't understand purpose. We don't understand intent. What God And so I believe today, if you would understand your value, young men, if you'd understand that God has something. That's, I didn't know there were churches inside of me, but it was the darkest times of my life that God brought the churches out of my life. This church was born from the darkest time in my life, and God birthed it. Uh, the Crosby Church, the darkest time. I didn't know what I was going to do in life. It was birthed from that. It's amazing to me how it's during the hard times that God pulls something out of you. And many of us, we go through dark times. We say, God, I don't have no understanding of what's fixing to happen. And the next thing you know, God finds you. He finds you at a crossroad. He finds us tied up. Last week, I listened to uh, Johnny uh, Brother Johnny, I call him. He's not a pastor. He's an evangelist. But uh, teaching, and, and it just blessed my heart. I thought it was one of the most profound, because I, I learned something. I don't sit here as a pastor and go, well, here again, let this guy just see if he knows something I know. I want to know what they know. Amen. I want to listen to what they listen to. Now, I'm not a cowboy either, but I've cowboyed up, and I've cowboyed down. I have uh, 15 years of my life was spent on the back of a horse. I rode, uh, we shot off horses, I roped, I, I worked cows, I did the best I could. But I really was never a real, what I would call, cowboy. Amen. But I, I learned at it. My daughter is proficient at riding horses, Mandy, my oldest. She went to school, she learned more than what she already known, but she taught me something. Mandy taught me that you have to understand that a horse is automatically wild, even if you've not been on them in a while. We used the term green, that a horse can get green. They get sour kind of quick. And when they do, they can buck you. And when they buck you, you have to understand as they start to buck that, and she would tell me, she said, Dad, you got to, you got to ride that horse when it starts bucking, when it starts crow hopping. You got to press it. You don't get off of it. It wants you off. But you got to ride that horse just a little while. And she even used the term, you got to ride the buck out of it. And I found that when I got born again, I was a little bit on the wild side. Johnny last week used the term feral. He said anything wild is feral. That came from a conversation from Saturday night when we sat and had a meal. And he asked me, he said, what does holy wild mean? And I told him that Jesus rides on clouds, he walks on water, that when he comes into the life of someone, he, makes a, he takes the wild and makes them holy. He starts working on them. He changed their life. Now, listen, Johnny had a sermon to already preach Sunday morning, but after that conversation, he changed his sermon. And I thought, okay, where are we going? Because he said God never intended for us to be wild, and that's true. He didn't intend for us to be feral. He didn't intend, because a feral horse lives eight to ten years. He talked about the romance of being free. 
the romance was just running wild and the horse's hair flowing and the snort. And I, and I could see it in my mind. And I thought to myself, man, that's a great picture. But he said when he went to catch wild horses, he found their teeth were broken. They were unable to eat. He found their hooves were too long and they were unable to run. He found that parasites had invaded their body and worms had got inside of them. And what they needed was somebody to catch them and tame them. And I thought to myself, how many people do I know whose lives have just went feral and they've died young? Amen. They've gotten stupid. They got addicted. Life's just went. And what they needed was Jesus. Amen. They needed understanding. They needed intent in their life. They needed to find purpose in their life. And I want to tell you, there are times I've gotten traffic in the wild. The Pharaoh starts rising up in me. And all of a sudden, I feel like the, the, the peace of God dwells on me. And he said, I got you, son. Amen. You can get mad if you want to, but you're not getting out of this traffic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Amen. So he calms me down. Somebody aggravates me, crosses me the wrong way, and I fold up my fist, and all of a sudden the, the Holy One gets on top of me and says, Hey, now, you were feral. You used to punch them, but you don't punch now. You don't fight now. You don't do that now. Watch your language, son. Oh. And now there's some words that maybe in certain company I permit myself, but there's certain language I will never use. You'll never hear certain language come out of my mouth because God tamed me from that. And I learned, I learned from the best. My daddy was the best cusser I ever met. My daddy invented words. Amen. He'd go after, but I learned because the, once the Holy One starts riding you, when he gets with you and he lives within you, all of a sudden that Pharaoh that you once were, now we use the term holy wild, amen, that God has come into our lives and begin to shift. And now we have understanding. Everybody say understanding. So I started understanding. I started getting into his precepts. I started figuring this thing out. And so I really appreciated what I heard last week because it, it affected my life. And I thought, Johnny, and afterward we had a really, again, long talk, feel like I found a brother in the house, but I want to tell you something, that intent is a very powerful thing. There's a power of purpose in all of our lives. Let me lay a little foundation here. The most important key to understanding is the intent. What is the intent of uh, why you are here or what you are doing? Intent is the original purpose. Intent is the big picture. Why did God do what he did? Why did he create the earth? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. See, I stand on the word of God as the absolute truth. So he created the earth and, the, and then he made the earth for us. He set the earth so close to the sun that we will never freeze and not far enough back that we never burn up. He was so perfect what he did and the, and the rotations and, and how things work. It just He's never stopped. And if you plant seed, it's going to come forth. You'll see the blooming. That, that, again, that's not evolution. That's God. God did that for us. Amen. He said things he had an intent. Intent is the source of motivation. It's the reason for creation. The horse was created for a purpose. The horse was created for a purpose. When Johnny mentioned last week, there were no horses in America until the conquistadors came here and trained them. When he turned them loose, then, and when nobody would ride them, then all of a sudden they became wild. And wild was not a good thing. And sometimes I think because of the way I preach or maybe the things I say, you may think, well, I can just do be whatever I want. That's not, that is not what we're talking about here. Amen. I want to be tamed by the tamer. Amen. I won't go, I, I'm still wild. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But it's not my will that's wild. It's my personality. Amen. Amen. It's just who I am. It's how God made me. He never stopped that from happening. So, so to understand creation, you've got to understand the intent of the creator for creation. When I was out in Colorado, I saw the most beautiful mountains. I rode through the snow. I hit a, a windstorm, a 70-mile-an-hour windstorm that was pushing me, pushing my truck from behind, amen, pushed me for 60 miles. I, I got 23 miles to the gallon. I turned around and had to go back the other way. I dropped down to 13. Amen. Everything I gained going one way, I lost going the other. Amen. But I thought the creation of God is so majestic. It's so bad. The, the, the mountains, the snow on top, of all the, the, the rocks, the crags, everything about it. I just thought, God, you're so good. Amen. All you do. When intent or purpose is not known, listen to me, misunderstanding and abuse is inevitable. If you don't know the purpose for something, you will abuse it. Amen. If you don't know the per if you don't know the per if you think that a vacuum cleaner is made to suck water out of your tub, You've missed the whole intent of a vacuum cleaner, and you will not live long. <laughs> Misunderstanding guarantees the abuse of time, energy, gifts, talents, and resources producing anger with the system. Misunderstanding. So his word gives me understanding. 
But if I don't pay attention to his word, I go into misunderstanding. And when I misunderstand something, I start to abuse it. There's permanence of purpose. The plans may change, but purpose remains the same. You may change the way you, but God has a purpose for you. Amen. You may decide to do your own thing. God still has a purpose for you. Proverbs 19, 21 says, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. What a man desires is unfailing love. Better be poor than a liar. Isaiah 46, 10, I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come? I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. This is what the Lord says. Now listen to me. God, oh, this is the wild thing about God. God finishes things first. God finishes things first. Now you may not realize this, but he sees you as a finished product. He sees you as somebody that's fulfilling purpose in, in not only in your life, but also on this earth. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight in love that before you ever showed up god had a thought about you and he said you know what i choose you to be blameless i choose you to live in love i choose you to have purpose so before you even got here and you think to yourself man i sure screwed a lot of stuff up god said let me tell you something i i, I chose you amen and before it's over i believe you're going to be blameless can i get an amen he chose me. He chose me. You before the creation of the world. How important are you? How, how much purpose you got in you? God said, I chose you before you got here. I picked you, man. You didn't have to jump up and down and say, pick me, pick me. God said, I already chose you. But I'm the shortest. God said, but I already chose you. Amen. I already got a plan for you. He has a purpose for us. God's eternal purpose will keep on enduring. Luke 7, 29. All the people, even the tax collectors, when they heard Jesus' words, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees, the preachers of the day, and experts in the law, they rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. They didn't follow John's teaching. John preached the kingdom of God. Amen. That the kingdom was coming. Amen. He shared purpose about the kingdom. He, you know, you're going to choose, it's according to what you follow, to how you live. And if you follow this book, if you follow him, amen, all of a sudden now life begins to make sense. Now listen to me very careful. You have to live life intentionally. Go to this next slide. Keep going. One more. When elements of nature lose their purpose, chaos and destruction are the results. What I've seen in Seattle and Portland and, and Minnesota and places like that, and, and New Orleans, amen, people start losing their purpose. When nations, communities, friendships, churches, marriages live without intent. Next slide. Purposeful living. Then confusion, frustration, discouragement, disillusionment, disengagement, whether gradual or instant will happen. I've always called these the three Ds. It's 3D vision. It's distortion. Amen. Here they are. Discouragement, disillusion, disengagement. Whenever you lose intent in life, you get, you get discouraged. Then you get disillusioned. It happens in the church world. It happens in the business world. Amen. Then you disengage. You disconnect from it. So you've got to understand the intent of something and why you're there and the purpose that God has in your life. Jesus was a master teacher. When you listen to him, listen to what he says. Catch what he's saying. Now, Pastor Mike was telling me this morning he was going to teach on the 521 talents. And I said, that's right before Jesus rode the little coat. He said, that's right. So God gave some people five talents, some two, some one. Don't be discouraged. You don't know exactly what it is you got. But inside of all of us, like inside of Adam was Eve, inside of Abraham was a nation, Inside of me were churches. Inside of you are businesses. Some of you started businesses. Inside of you, some of you mamas, you did not know that you could birth such beautiful children. You had no idea because of who you were married to. But God worked a miracle anyway. Can I get an amen? He's like that. Luke chapter 19, verse 28. After Jesus had said this, after the 521, the issue that there is no fairness in life. After Jesus said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a coat. A coat. This is a young animal. This is probably one and a half, two year old coat. Amen. There. Some call it, considered it a donkey. We're just going to use the word coat here. Tied there, which no one, this is what got me, which no one has ever ridden. Untie and bring to. I want you to go find a coat, and I'm going to tell you about this coat. I know where it's at. I know it. Mark said it's at a crossroad. I'm going to tell you this coat is unbroke. This coat, I want you to find that coat. 
Now, as a disciple, I'm thinking to myself, that's not the animal you want. This is not the one you want to ride. You know, it's, it's my hope that all these young men and ladies in here get a chance to ride something that's never been ridden. It'll change your life. It will affect you. Amen. I've watched my daughter break horses. I've watched other friends break horses. I've never broke a horse. Amen. I rode horses that I, I thought that were supposed to have been broke that weren't broke. <laughs> Amen. I've been thrown by the best of them. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, its owner asked, hey, what are you doing untying the coat? And they replied, the Lord needs it. And there was no argument. It was as if there was an understanding between Jesus. I don't, did he meet the man before? Was there a connection there? Did this man already love the Lord? Amen. I, I don't know. But somehow in this story, it was already set up. Jesus knew where the coat was. He knew it was untamed. Amen. And he knew that an owner would release it to him. And this is when he rolled into Jerusalem and all of them threw the palm branches and yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna to the king. Lord, Hosanna means save me now. Rescue me now. But this moment that Jesus gets this little coat and he rides on it, it blows my mind, amen, that he could sit on an unbroke horse and the horse all of a sudden becomes tamed. There's something about the peace of God, amen, the nature of Jesus, that when he comes into your life, as wild and feral as we may be at one time or another, he calms us down. He literally rides, amen, everything out of us that was once there, the meanness, the hurt, the, the hatefulness, the lustfulness, he begins to take it out of our lives, amen, and here's his coat is his natural, natural for that coat to buck. If you throw a fly, oh my goodness, how many times have I been out at the ranch riding horses when I looked over and saw a horse fly on the back of my daughter's horse? And I thought to myself, somebody needs to hit that horse fly. And I'd slap that horse fly and that horse would take off. And I think to myself, I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> Amen. But eventually, if something's going to make that horse jerk. And here he is. Calm. They first they threw blankets on him. If you've ever tried to break a horse, that's the first procedure. You put the blanket over on that horse, something on their back, it's unnatural to them. They're not used to that moment. So they put it on him, and then they set Jesus on him. They, if, if, let me see it again. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, and they picked Jesus up and put him on the coat. And the coat did not buck. The coat did not jump. It didn't jitter. It was that moment when the coat realized everything about my life comes to this moment that I have an opportunity to carry the king into Jerusalem. His little tail wagon, amen, the excitement. Can you imagine that moment? And I, I know some of us think, well, that coat don't think nothing like that. Listen, you ain't got no idea what a horse is thinking. <laughs> amen. There are times I've looked at my horse and I, somebody say, watch your ears. Watch their ears. If them ears go back, you're going up. <laughs> Watch that. If their ears go forward, they see something ahead. Because horses have a flight, a fight. Amen. They, 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 normally it's flight. They're going to run. Amen. They're going to take off. But this little colt, when they, Jesus gets on his back, it's like heaven's setting up there. Peace is up there. And when Jesus comes into your life and begins to change and turn, first of all, let me tell you, he knows your place. Amen. He knows where I'm at and where I'm going. The scripture says in verse 30, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt there. Listen, Christianity is God's attempt to find you. When we say we found God, we didn't find God. He was hunting for us. He knew we were at the crossroad. Amen. He knew where we were at. And because of that, he found us. Amen. He found the coat there at the cross. Mark eleven four. 4. And they went their way and found the coat tied by the door without in a place where two ways met. There. Isn't it wild that God found you at a crossroad? Every one of us, as we got older, we could have went either way. Amen. We could have headed wrong, head right. It's our call. But when he found us, amen, he took us. Nobody, listen to me, church, nobody can take your place. There was nobody could take the place of that donkey or that colt. Nobody could. Amen. He was there. Well, you, you have to work your job till you find your work, your place. Everybody said, I don't know where my place Work your job. 
And when you work your job long enough, you'll find your place. What we are taught controls our life. Amen. Every created being was created with a place in life, a gift discovered, with a God-given intention, which will make them a leader. You know, fish were made for water. Birds were made for air. Man was made for the earth. God, God created If you take the, the fish out of the water, what happens? The fish dies. He's made for the water. When you take, uh, 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 what else you take man out of the earth in our lives, I'm trying to think where I'm going here. Don't film me. This cat camera went up and it messed me up every time. Uh, when I think about God in my life and how he calmed things down, what would happen in your life if you decided to say, God, I, I, I give you a control. Uh, you, whatever you want to do with me. Is there a business inside of me? Uh, some of you, a child, is there, what is it to God that you want? Is adoption, what is it you want in my life? Amen. I, I just want to be used of you. Hallelujah. And when you find that place that you surrender, and that was the issue with the coat. He just surrendered. And Johnny mentioned last week the old horse that dropped his head and just surrendered. There are times you hit bottom. You're wore out, your feet are wore out, your teeth don't work no more, things ain't happening, amen, and you just want to drop your head and say, take me, Jesus, amen. I, I want to do that while I'm younger, too. Can I get amen? Amen, because here's the thing. When you pursue God's kingdom, we're so much after stuff. Psalm Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Do you realize how many things that we would already get if we would just seek the kingdom of God? The, the, you say, I, I want a house, I want a vehicle, I want a relationship. I want Seek God. Everything you want is seeking after him. He wants to bless you with it. Amen. He wants to provide the clothing for your back. Amen. Your mortgage. He wants to take care of you. Can I be very honest with you? God wants you debt free. If you make right choices, that's where he wants you to go. So as I walk through this, I realize that if I get out of my place, it brings stress. How many of you just love stress? How many of you just, you just, you embrace high blood pressure? I mean, it's when you go to the doctor and they tell you your blood pressure, you go, oh, thank you, Jesus. No, I walk in there. They strap that thing to me. They ask me, what do you do? I say, I get to run a camp. I pastor two churches. I got a great staff. I got this and that and the other. And they say, just strap that thing up. They, and we'll play the guessing game. They'll say, what do you think your blood pressure is? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's 120 over 80. They said, that's perfect. And I said, give it a shot. And I'll be right there every time. Because what I've learned is that I can't live under the stress that used to almost kill me 20 years ago. 20, I've lived life out of two, 2020. It's been my life. Amen. I had 20 years of, of, of evangelizing and pastoring that almost killed me. And then this last 20 years, I said, I ain't hurrying. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get stressed. I'm not, uh, I'm going to stay effective. I'm not busy. Do you ask the guys, I, I don't live busy life. I take care of the weddings. I take care of funerals. I take care of the services. I, I give people advice. I don't counsel. I'm not a counselor. I serve a counselor. I preach from here. If you want to know something, listen to me here. You won't need me out there. So I've changed the way I think. And by doing that, stress begins to leave me. And I fight for peace. It's one of the few things I fight for, to keep peace in my life. Stress is the result of doing something outside of your place. You don't see me grabbing Josiah's guitar from him and saying, step aside, son. Let me show you how it's done. This church would empty so fast. You'd realize I'm doing something outside of my place. Amen. That ain't my place over there. I, I, I can fret a little. I know G, C, and D, but don't do them minors. <laughs> Stress is pressure placed on your body emotionally, intellectually, physically, and psychologically. Until you learn to just live in your place where God found you. When he found that coat, he found him at his place. Amen. Adrenaline has to be produced to deal with stress. Being out of, out of place, a, a job you're not made for, a work you don't enjoy. I hear people say, I just don't like my job. Change it. You live in the greatest nation on the planet. Change your job. 
Amen. Well, there may be a gap. Change it. Do something you enjoy. Life is too short for you to hate everything you're doing all the time. And I know I may get some of you in trouble. You may quit your job or do this, that, and the other. But just find, begin to find, ask God, Lord, I'm seeking you. And listen to me. Here's wisdom. Stay with your job until you know the other one's there. Then give two or three weeks notice so they can fire you early. It'll be on them, not you. Amen. Do that. And, don't, and then when you leave, don't say nothing bad about where you just left. Don't spit in the well. Someday you may have to go back and drink from it. You may have to take that job again. This is good, practical advice from a whole lot of living. All right? So to learn that. So when you shift, ask God. Say, Lord, I, I, I don't like my job. So if you don't like your job, find another job. Find it until you get a career. So the opposite of stress is peace. Jesus being the prince of peace, not stress. He's not, he not the prince of stress. He's the prince of peace. And, I, you know, when I'm outside my place, I become stressed. Longevity is related to me finding my place. Premature death is often a result of being outside my spot. Amen. Peace is God's original plan for my life. But, Pastor, what if I got problems? The donkey was tied up. The word tied resembles the idea of addiction, being, being stuck in somewhere. Amen. You're going to find that coat tied up there. Listen to me. You'll pass problems, addictions, messed up life. It doesn't determine or stop your usefulness. God will still untie you and ride you. Amen. He will ride all the problems out of you. People who refuse to allow God to help them in their place, they get themselves in a lot of trouble. Angels that got out of place became devils. You realize that? The demons are simply out of place angels. They got out of place. Stay in your place. My personality. They brought it to Jesus, the coat, threw their coats on it, and Jesus, and put Jesus on it. Jesus knows that I can be ridden without breaking my spirit. He'll break my will. It's my will we got issues with. It's that stuff. Some of you got to think stubbornness is a spiritual gift. She'll even say it about you, sir. My husband is so stubborn. And she'll bring that out. She's not bragging about you. She's talking about how stupid you are. Amen. Your stubbornness is not a gift. Amen. It's a sin. It, it got the children of Israel in trouble. They were stiff-necked and stubborn. Amen. They were going to go their own way. Listen, when, when an animal tries to go its own way, if you're riding a horse, the bit is to correct him, to move him in a death. Then you spur him on. The Scripture tells us to spur one another on into good works, to encourage one another to do the right thing. I, I had a horse once I got from a friend of mine named Jake Jones. It was the stubbornest. It was the laziest. It was the biggest horse. It was so big when Don Nash and I went to get the horse, we put him in a trailer. We went in a short trailer. When we shoved the gate, his butt, we had to literally lean on it to get the gate to shut, take him all the way from Tulsa, rub the hair right off his hiney. Amen. Got him back, backed him out of the trailer, got on him, and I had to just spur, spur to get him going. And I used to, I preached a sermon years ago called Put a Demand on It. Because that horse, you had to put a demand on him to get him to do anything. I enjoyed it. I shot off that horse. I fell off that horse. I had so much fun on that horse. Then I, then I said, you know what? I'm giving that horse to Pastor David Hilton. <laughs> Best move ever made. The horse had a personality. That horse named Rojo had a personality. Man, that horse was fast. Everything about him was speed. And if I didn't hold him back, he, you'd get him in the block to get ready to go race or do anything. My daughter would use him for barrel racing. He was just chomping at the bit. He got to go, got to go, got to go. Amen. Some of you that way. You're just, just chomping at the bit to go, 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 go. And every now and then God's got to put a bit in your mouth to hold you back just a little bit. Amen. He knows the power. You can feel the power building underneath that horse. You do in just a minute, that horse going to spring, man, and you better stay puckered in that saddle. Amen. Because you know he's going to, boom. He would flash out of there. But the greatest rides I ever had was on Rojo. Amen. Just love racing that horse and running that horse and shooting off that horse. He lived 30 years because I cared for him. I shot his feet. I floated his head. Lord, it floated his teeth. I took care of him. I gave him the best food two days, two times a day. Yet blessed him. Amen. 30 years. He probably lived longer if he hadn't went through Hurricane Harvey. Amen. He just, he, he just amazing animal. But again, had it been Pharaoh, he wouldn't have made it 10 years. And that's the same way God wants to tame he, your personality. I've heard people say when you get born again, God got to change it. No, he don't. God don't change your personality. He gave you your personality. 
You sanguine, melancholy, phlegmatic, choleric. You're something like that. You either laid back, melancholy. Mm -hmm. I used to hate melancholy people. I think to myself, how can you be so <clears throat> uncaring? How could you be so laid? A storm would be outside, and you're like a sloth heading to the corner of the house. Amen. Sanguines, what? They're grabbing stuff, putting stuff up. You know, I mean, H U R. Amen. Uh, I, I, I hang out with sanguines. I, I connect with sanguines. Sanguines are just outgoing. They're, they're extroverted. They're, they're salesmen. They're, 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 they're yakkers. You hate them, don't you, melancholy people? And yet, God said, I made you that way. That's why I never beat people up in times of worship. Some melancholy people, they don't work. They, it's just who they are. It's who they, God made them that way. Now, I believe we can all lift our hands. I believe we can all get a little shit. If you do it at a football, basketball, baseball game, you ought to be able to do it at church. Don't throw, that, don't throw your personality at me now. If you can do it there, you can do it here. But then there are times I realize that's just who they are. I got friends, I love them. I know they love Jesus. But they sit in church and they just kind of look around during worship. And every now and then they'll close one eye and the other eye. And if they ever raise their hands, it's like revival's fixing to break forth in here. We're fitting to have some kind of crazy thing take place. Amen. Because God got hold of their personality. They're fitting to do something now. You know, I mean, whoa! Uh, I, got, I got one friend. I, can, I won't even name his name. He's out at the other campus. I watch him. I just, he's like the trigger for revival. I'm waiting to see what's fixing to happen. Amen. Hey, I'm, I know it's going to take place. But, but listen to me. You don't have to be like me. I'm the only me I can be. You're the only you you can be. But there's so much value in you. You just be your shiny self. Amen. If God made you laid back, be laid back. Quit picking on them. Some of you, you, you married people that you, didn't, you thought their personality was way out there. They did that just to get you. <laughs> they faked you off. Yeah, love is blind. Marriage is an eye opener. <laughs> Take Peter. Look at Peter. Look at, I mean, when I look at Peter, tell me, is Peter introverted or extroverted? Oh, he extroverted. He the one got his foot in his mouth all the time. He's, he's the crazy one. And yet, with that personality, Jesus tamed him. Amen. He rolled him. He rolled the buck right out of that man. Amen. He took it. He, he didn't stop Peter from fishing. He just changed what he was fishing for. He said, you're not going to fish for fish. You're going to fish for men. He, he looked at Peter. He's the one that said, Peter said, that's you. Bid me come. She said, come on, wild child. Peter gets out, walks on the water, realizes this is good. And all of a sudden, he starts to sink on his way down. Help! What's he doing? Help ride me. Jesus picks him up, takes him all the way. They walk right back to the boat. Amen. Malchus shows up with a group of 600 men. Amen. And they were going to arrest Jesus. What does Peter do right after he wakes up from sleeping for for an hour, Jesus kept waking him up in the Garden of Gethsemane. He drinks out his sword, slashes Malchus's ear off. Hello? You can't get a melancholy to do that. You can't get an, extra, an introvert to do that. That's extroverted living. Amen. He wakes up, slashes the ear. Now, 600 swords go. <laughs> they fixing to kill Peter. At that moment, Jesus said, put up your sword. He grabs the ear of Malchus, stuck it back on his head. He reattached it without stitches. He understood the intent, the purpose. He wasn't going to let them kill Peter at that moment. He had purpose for Peter. So he sticks, he rescues him, not once walking on water, but now twice. And this, he keeps rescuing you. He looks after, ear back on. Amazing scene when I see that. And then Jesus said, uh, he actually tells them uh, not to put, when it comes to swords, I, I remember reading where Jesus made this statement. Jesus said, put the sword up, but don't get rid of it. He told them not to get rid of their swords. You know what that tells me? You better stay armed every now and then. You better watch after yourself. Amen. You're not called to be a pacifist. Can I get an amen? So my spirit my spirit is my attitude, my sparkle, my life, my lively, my risk-taking, my courage, my daring, my animation. That's your spirit. That's who you are. Your will is that which you determine to do, decision or believe to be necessary. It's something you decided to do. 
Some of you had to break your will to come to church this morning. Your, your spirit, amen, lively, is excited, was sleepy. And your will was saying, well, let's just agree and go back to bed. Amen. <laughs> amen. But you had to break your will, get up, get ready, and get to church. Amen. That's what we do. We break the will, and we show up in the house. Amen. It's an important thing. Hallelujah. Yeah. So this is what God changes in us is our will. Imagine if Jesus hadn't come into your life, what you'd be like right now. You'd be feral. You'd be wild on the wrong side. Amen. You'd be messed up. Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane three times, and he prayed the same prayer all three times. He went a little further, fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I want to, not as I will, not as I desire, not as I think what is right, but what you think is right. What you think is right. You see the humanity of Jesus, the personality of Jesus. See, what I believe, I, this is on, I believe Jesus was choleric, sanguine, phlegmatic, and melancholy. I believe he's all four. Some of us, we can't be anything other than what we are. But I think Jesus at times, man, he was sanguine. He was out there. He walking on water. Other times I see him on the side of the mountain, melancholy, laid back, laid back. He could use his personalities. It's just who he was. He was a whole man. God didn't break his spirit. Jesus needed courage to do the will of God. He knows we need our spirit to do his will. When he rode that colt, he didn't break the personality of that coat. He broke his will. And what we got to have is our will broke. Amen. Say, God, I want you to take whatever it is I've been deciding to do. Help me break that and do what you want me to do. Because what you want me to do is always the right thing. Amen. Some of you say, well, man, that sounds boring. I have not been bored in 40 years. I don't know what boredom's like. I met a man up there in Colorado. I mean, I'm at a baseball game. I look over at him and I say, hey, get talking with him. Next thing I know, we're talking cars. Next thing I know, he's telling me he got a $69 Dodge Charger. The next thing I ask him is where you live. I'm inviting myself to your house. Then I get over there, he got a 68 Fastback. Amen. Then he got a 68 a Chevelle 396 Super Sport, Dennis, that he paid $340 for. I want to know this man. This is my new friend, Ken. <laughs> my personality says, I'm going to connect with you, sir. And next thing you know, we get talking about God. Amen. And, we, and it just comes out how the Lord has been taking care of us. And you don't do that if you just sit around. Now, I know some of you would really be this. It would scare you to talk to somebody other than somebody that's sitting next to you. But I'm going to find people out there. I mean, I'm always searching and looking and believing God that he'll give me a divine appointment. I, and who knows? I may get in my car or my dreams yet. Mm -hmm. I got to close here. Amen. He knows my purpose. Everybody say purpose. So he knows my place. Amen. He, he knows the things I'm connected with. He knows my personality. Hallelujah. He, he knows it, that, that it, not only my place, but he also knows where he can find me. When he finds me there, amen, he starts looking after me, but my purpose. And this humbled me. Go get that coat. Tell the man the Lord needs him. Have you ever realized how much God needs you? He doesn't have to use you. We're all replaceable. If we just want to walk away, God can always replace us. But the truth of the matter is, God needs us. He, every purpose he does on this earth, I need my children. I need my grandchildren. Amen. And him being a father, he needs us. God gives me opportunity to fulfill my purpose. Purpose is, again, we're going back to intent, the original intent. What was the reason for my creation? God's the only one who knows. People ask you all the time, what do you think my purpose is? I don't know. You got to discover it. It may be a, in a, in a carpentry. It may be cooking. It may, it may be blessing somebody. It may be baseball. It could be a sport. It could be a sport. I don't know. But you got to discover what it is. First off, I can tell you this. He wants you to love mercy, do humbly, and walk, uh, and, uh, do, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with him. And when you do that, you begin to discover things. And then conviction comes over your life. When you know your purpose, you're convinced of your value. You're valuable. You need to tell your kids that. Your kids need to know how valuable they are. You know why I go get my grandkids? I want them to, to know how valuable they are. 
I want them to know that I love them like that. Amen. Why do I spend time with Katie and sometimes Johnny? I want them to know how valuable they are. Amen. There's something about value. It's important to put in. Only value, you know what gives value? Time. When you give somebody time, your time is valuable. You only get so much of it. It's, it's irreplaceable. You don't get it again. So when you don't hurry off from somebody and you give them a little time to talk and you listen to them, you're sharing with them their value. Value is determined by refined uniqueness. Your uniqueness makes you valuable. Everybody here is valuable. Everyone. Even you, Kenny. I said that for Young's benefit. I want to remind her. Be significant. Be significant. Amen. Spend time with the manufacturer. When you do that, you'll get the original.